Well, good morning and welcome to this day that the Lord hath made and to this our worship of God here at historic St. Timothy's Episcopal Church in downtown Calhoun, Georgia. Let us begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son came into the world, that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Amos. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear. Or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Hear the words of the psalmist from Psalm 70. Be pleased, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those who seek my life be ashamed and altogether dismayed. Let those who take pleasure in my misfortune draw back and be disgraced. That, let those who say to me, Aha, and gloat over me, turn back because they are ashamed. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say forever, Great is the Lord. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Come to me speedily, O God. You are my helper and my deliverer. O oh Lord, do not tarry.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the, the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. But while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Well, in the gospel story just read, Jesus tells us of a bridegroom that is delayed from coming home from his honeymoon. At his home, which is really his father's home, there are ten bridesmaids awaiting his return. Today, if we were able to have a wedding here in this church during this time of COVID, which of course we cannot, but if we could, the job of the bridesmaids would simply be to surround the bride, be present, and be pretty. In Jesus' time and culture, however, bridesmaids had a more practical job. It was their job to be present when the groom came home with his new bride and to welcome the couple and to make the newlywed couple, especially the bride, to be made to feel welcome and to feel at home. But alas, in this case, the bride and the groom in this story have been delayed. For what reason, we do not know. Maybe their flight was delayed, or maybe they decided to spend an extra day on their honeymoon, or maybe they detoured to the beach to watch their first sunset together as husband and wife. We don't know, for we are not told. We only know that they are, in fact, late, and that the bridesmaids are anxiously awaiting their arrival. It is so late, in fact, it has become dark. And so, if the couple were to arrive now, all would need artificial light to see by. Well, half the girls are clever and begin to prepare for a late night arrival. The other half are irresponsible and do not prepare. And the ones who are irresponsible pay the price for their lack of planning. They will find themselves shut out. And, you know, that's pretty much the story. It's not so much a story about how to live for the future or even how to live in the present, as it is a story about how to live and waiting. It is also a story about the tension between grace on the one hand and consequences on the other. I don't know about you, but part of me wants to berate the first, or rather the five bridesmaids who have prepared, but are not, who are not sharing their oil with the girls who have not prepared. 
part of me wants to say, well, for heaven's sakes, give the other five girls a little bit of your oil. I mean, how much could it hurt? And how much oil do you need anyway? And you know, you're liable to find yourselves without oil someday, and you'd be pretty happy if someone shared what they had with you, wouldn't you? And if this story were about grace, well, I guess that would do. But this little story would seem to be not so much about grace as it is about the reality of consequences. The prophet Amos alerts us that it will be this kind of story. He starts the ball rolling on this theme. He says, if you abuse your neighbor, if you treat those who are less fortunate than yourselves unjustly, God will not be pleased. If your modus operandi is to take advantage of those around you, the day of the Lord will not be pleasant for you. Rather, it will feel more like a day of severe judgment. Not much that sounds like grace in that story, is there? And then in the gospel, the five bridesmaids who had planned well and have uh, adequate supplies to meet their need are not in the slightest inclined to share what they have with the have-nots. Not much grace there either. These are texts that the church has long held to be a warning to be ready for judgment and to be ready for one's own death and to be ready for the return of Christ. And my guess is we don't particularly like it. This is not a fun little story. We don't want to be we want don't want to be reminded of the law. We don't want to be reminded that there is a law which speaks of consequences and for bad actions. What we tend to want is a gospel that is solely and totally a gospel of grace. But alas, there is no such gospel. No such gospel where that is where that is only grace, and there is only grace, and there are no consequences for our actions or poor decision making. Even in a world created by a loving God who is full of grace and one who is sometimes described as love personified, there are still consequences for exercising bad choices but thanks be and praise to god that this is also a gospel of amazing and wonderful grace the good book is about good news or else it would hardly have earned the title the writer of this gospel and those with whom he lived in community were beginning to realize that they were living in a time of waiting a time of delay, if you will have it. A time between what has been and what is to come. They, as well as their predecessor Paul, had expected an early return of Christ. Certainly within their lifetime, they believed. They believed that Christ was coming back very soon indeed. This view was so broadly held that many just quit working or paying much attention to anything having to do with taking care of business. I mean, why worry? Why toil? Jesus, Jesus is coming any minute. But Jesus has not returned. And so maybe they begin to think, maybe one should think about what one is to do and how one is to live in the meantime. This is the transition we are beginning to see take shape in this gospel story. Jesus has not yet returned, and time is moving on. And so under the circumstances, under this new reality, people begin to ask themselves, well, what is one to do? Well, one choice, clearly, is to become jaded, maybe not unlike a jilted lover, to become bitter, hard, cold, disinterested, 
and, in, and to turn a cold shoulder to all things spiritual, to all things having to do with the other, to all matters bigger than myself. Jesus has not returned as he said he would. Jesus has let me down. I think I'll just go back to my old ways. Well, that's one choice, but another choice would be to give in to the temptation, to give ourselves over to a self-centered existence with little to no regard for how I am or are not in relationship to others, especially those less fortunate than myself. After all, it is just a dog-eat-dog world. The problem with such a self-centered life, however, is that maybe quite unexpectedly and maybe quite to our surprise, it leads to a depletion of our own happiness and our own sense of well-being. But there is an alternative. And that alternative is that we can allow ourselves to be filled with the energy that is and which comes from prayer. We can immerse ourselves and allow ourselves to be sustained by the communion of the saints, nourished by the sacraments, and allow the community of saints to shoulder us and to invite the life-giving words of Jesus to animate our lives. Yet the harsh reality is that spiritual oil, so to speak, cannot be bought and sold as can oil for a lamp. I cannot give you some of my spirituality, nor can you give me some of yours. We cannot exchange spiritual oil any more than an athlete who is diligently trained can give a friend the benefits of his training, or a diligent student can give another the benefit of her studying. Maintaining a right relationship with God and maintaining a right relationship with our neighbor is something that we must do for ourselves. Yet, not one of us is fully wide awake all the time. Not one of our spiritual lamps is full all the time. Dear ones, the good news that makes God's word the good news is that God can and does do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That is to say, salvation comes as a gift. We are saved by grace, not by how much oil is in our lamp come judgment day. And this is God's truth, whether Jesus comes back this afternoon or tomorrow or next week or a thousand years from now. We are saved. We are made more whole, fully justified by God's unconditional, unending, and unparalleled love. A love, a forgiveness, a grace, the supply of which never runs out. And thanks be to God that it is so. Amen.
In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, and for all who work for justice and promote the dignity of all persons, for our schools, and for all who occupy them, keep them safe, Bless all schools that they may be centers of sound learning, critical thinking, and the pursuit of wisdom. As you call us to love and compassion, equip social service agencies, relief organizations, shelters, and food pantries to care for those in need, remembering especially the Voluntary Action Center and all ministries and agencies serving this community for the just and proper use of your creation, that all persons everywhere will come to appreciate the fragility of the systems that sustain life on this earth and that the peoples of the world would unite to protect and nurture this planet, this gift from God that is our island home. We pray for the work of Amnesty International and we pray for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression wherever they may be. Visit all prisons with your comforting presence and give the incarcerated hope for their futures. During this time of pandemic, heal those who are sick with this virus. May they regain their strength and health. We remember health care workers and first responders. May you keep them safe. May your guiding wisdom be with us, and may your healing hand be upon us all. For our bishop, for our presiding bishop Michael, our bishops Rob, Don, and Paul, and Frank, our priest, we pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. For the peace and unity of the Church of God, and for all who seek relationship with the author of love, compassion, peace, and grace. Remembering especially Oliver and Emily, Tony Austin, Billy and Kay, Stephen, Moppy, Dale, Jennifer, Harvey, Lori, Patty, Linda, Marilyn and family, Winona, Alice Fay, June, Colleen, Ellen, Barbara and Chris, Bill, Dan, Jim, Alan, Adam, Shane, Garrett, Blake, Richard, Charlie, T, Richard, Gabriel, Noah, Jim, Gary, Amy, Eileen, Joe, and Ian and family, and for those of this congregation who are comforted by our continuing and sustaining prayers. We pray for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we take a moment to make room for our personal prayers. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. 
We remember those who celebrate their birthdays this week, Janie, Megan, Brett. O oh God, their times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. And now let us pray in the words our Lord Jesus Christ gave us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so now we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may Almighty God have mercy on us, Forgive us all of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And so now, as we bring this service to a close, go in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.